Welcome again to Greenfield in the Diaspora. Last Sunday, of course, was Easter morning, when the only suitable call to worship was the announcement of the event, resurrection, the greatest act of life-saving imaginable. Today and in the days ahead, we gather to remember that Easter is not just a day long ago in some distant land. Nor is it a day somewhere out in the future, we know not when, resurrection in our lives. But Easter is a way of doing life. Easter is the lens through which we see life. Every morning is Easter morning from now on. Welcome to worship. Our scripture lesson this morning comes from the 24th chapter of Luke's Gospel, a familiar story of the road to Emmaus. Listen for God's word. Now on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all the things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what are you discussing with each other as you walk along? They stood still looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? He asked them, what things? They replied, the things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, It is now the third day since those things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early in the morning. And when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that 
he had in, they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and they found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then, beginning with Moses and all of the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all of the scriptures. The word of the Lord. Our lesson from the road to Emmaus continues. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it is almost evening and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at table with them, he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. And then he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour, they got up and returned to Jerusalem, And they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, The Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I'll tell the story. I remember it like it was yesterday. You don't even know what you had for lunch yesterday. I do, too. I had... Why don't you tell the story? All right, I'll tell the story. Oh, I hate the way you tell the story. I'll tell the story. So there we were. It was the worst weekend of our life. Jesus had been crucified. He'd been placed in the tomb. And we were all in the upper room, and we were very, very scared. Oh, very scared and very nervous. 
Nervous as a pair of long-tailed cats in a room full of rockers. Now, just to clarify, there were no cats and there were no rocking chairs. I was speaking metaphorically. Well, you need to be more clear. I, I need you to be more clear. So anyway, it was chaos inside and then there was chaos outside. And it was Mary, and she was off in the distance, and she was yelling frantically. Yes, and then the doors bust open, and she's shouting at the top of her lungs, He's alive! He's alive! Now, Mary. Sweet Mary, uh, salt of the earth. Salt of the earth, that woman. But sometimes she gets... Well, she just gets a little confused. Oh, to say the least. I remember I said to you, I bet she went to the wrong tomb. <laughs> it was just such chaos, and so we decided that we'd go back to our homes. Right. Yeah. So we started back home. It's about a seven-mile walk on the road to Emmaus. And we're walking and talking. Talking and walking. Then all of a sudden, this man comes up behind us. Yes, I remember. He looked at us, and he said, um, he said, why the long faces? And I looked at him, and I said, that's just how we're made. We can't help it, and if you do not like it... The man was speaking metaphorically. Well, I needed him just to be clear. He wasn't clear. We said to him... Uh, oh, well, I said to him, I said, are you the only person in Jerusalem that hasn't heard just what has happened? Right, and I said yeah. to him, uh, Jesus had been crucified, we placed him in the tomb, now we can't find his body. And I went on to say we were just horribly disappointed because we thought Jesus was the one. And he says, uh, why are your head's so thick. Why, why are your heart so slow? And I looked at him right in the eye and I said, we're just getting older. We cannot help it. There's nothing we the can... The man was speaking metaphorically. I just needed him to be clear. Then he looked at us and he started at the beginning with the books of Moses and all through the prophets and explain to us how the scriptures said this would happen to the Messiah. It was wonderful. <laughs> it was amazing. We came to a fork in the road. Just to be clear, it wasn't a literal fork. We came to a spot where the road divided mm -hmm. and I invited him to join us for dinner. I think he said yes, because I told him my wife was making a cobbler. She makes a great cobbler. That woman can cobble. So we get here and we sit down for dinner. And he blessed the meal and he broke the bread. And then... I looked at you. And I looked at you. And we knew our hearts, they were burning inside of us. We were sitting with the Messiah. We, we were sitting at the table with the risen Savior. And then both of us, we, um, we turned to face him and, um, he was gone. Vanished. I never get tired of telling that story. <laughs> I may not remember what I had for lunch, but I'll never forget that story. Tell that story. Well, aren't you a regular Bobby Fisher? <laughs> King me. Not going to king you. King me. Not going to king you. No, king me. No, king. That's a good story. I'm not going to tell that story. Add that one to your book. That's a good story. What, the story of an old man who cheats at checkers to feel better about himself? You're not clarifying that at all. I just won. Look at right there. That's oh, a yeah. winner right there. That's a good story. That oh. would be the title of the book, The Winner. You are a winner. I am a winner. Look I'm what... speaking metaphorically. Well, why don't you king you me? You would not Archaeologists and historians have never been able to locate precisely this village of Emmaus that figures so prominently in our lesson this morning. 
They simply can't find any ancient sites that are exactly seven miles outside of Jerusalem. But Bill Beekner says he knows exactly where Emmaus is. In fact, he goes so far as to say he has been there. Now, you need to understand that Beekner is using that term Emmaus in a symbolic, not a geographic sense. He suggests that Emmaus is the place we always go to when we have run out of hope. Emmaus is what happens to us. It's where we try to get to when the shadow of some grief or, or failure or disappointment falls across our path. Emmaus is that place we head off to when we realize we have a past that is filled with memories. We have a present that is filled with pain. But what we don't have is a sense of the future. Out there ahead of us is simply a gaping hole with uncertainty and no sense of prospect or promise. And Beekner goes on to say he's not surprised when those two men set off on their way to Emmaus. We're told that it was the third day after a great tragedy. Now, you remember that these were followers of Jesus with their own eyes. They had seen him heal people with his hands. With their own ears, he had, they had heard him speak words of incredible insight and wisdom, and they honestly believed that they were in the presence of the long-awaited Messiah. In fact, just eight, eight days before, their enthusiasm had been peaked when Jesus himself rode into Jerusalem on a donkey, along with many of the other Passover pilgrims. Except when he entered that place, it was like people broke into spontaneous applause, almost as though the stones themselves were crying out. And on that night, his disciples were so excited about what was to, be, what was to happen. They would say things to one another like, any minute he's going to give the sign. People all over are going to rise up and drive out the Romans. Jerusalem will become the new Rome, and we are going to rule the world from this holy mountain, just as our ancestor David did centuries ago. And because they had signed on early in the movement, they believed that they would be given prominent places in that new administration. But then, lo and behold, their rendezvous with destiny turned out to be nothing more than a collision with catastrophe. On Monday, Jesus drove the money changers out of the temple, which disturbed the authorities because he, of course, was disrupting their profitable business. And it was then that they began to plot how to get rid of him. On Thursday night, in collusion with one of his own followers, they found him in a lonely place, far away from the crowds. It was then that they arrested him, went through the mockery of a trial, and before anybody had a chance to mount a counterattack, they had taken him outside the city walls and nailed him to a cross. By three o'clock in the afternoon, he was as dead as the nails they used to execute him. And with him, of course, died all of the hopes of those who had followed him, all of the dreams of his disciples. Beekner says that it is always the third day that is the worst, the third day after a catastrophe. And those of you who are people of sorrow and acquainted with grief, I would be surprised if you wouldn't agree. Because you know that when that catastrophe happens, at first you are so shocked and you feel numb. There are all these things that you have to take place. There are people who have to be notified. There's a funeral that has to be planned. But it's on the third day when all of the out-of-towners have gone back home, when all of the excitement dies down, 
Everybody else is returning to normal. That's when you realize you have no normal to return to. Your life has been torn apart. What it is that used to give meaning to your life is now gone. So here you have a past that is filled with memories. You have a present that is filled with pain. But what you don't have on that third day is any sense of the future. And that's the time when we all head out to Emmaus. Emmaus is where we go when we cannot bear the unbearable, all of the pain and the loss and the fear. And of course, you know that Emmaus has a thousand different faces. For some people, it's plunging themselves into a river of constant activity where they stay so busy, they don't have time to remember. They don't have time to feel. For others, it may be, may be taking a long trip or selling the house or looking for a new job. For some, it's beginning to drink too much, just to self-medicate from all of the pain. Emmaus has a thousand different faces. And if you have ever been a griever, I would be surprised if you, like Beekner, cannot say, I know exactly where that is, and I have been there. Beekner had his first experience of Emmaus when he was all of 10 years old. One Saturday morning, his father got up before everybody else in the family. He looked in on his two sons. Then he went down to the garage, made sure that the garage door was tightly shut. He got into the driver's seat for one last time, turned on the engine, and began his walk to Emmaus. Beekner's father was from a prominent family in New York. He had graduated from Princeton. He had lots of friends, was considered to be an exuberant type of person. But it was the time of the Great Depression, and he couldn't find and keep a job that enabled him to support his family in the ways that he wanted to. And he could not bear the shame of that. And so he took his trip to Emmaus, away from all of that unbearable pain. Beekner said that for years, people would ask him how his father died. And he would always answer that he died of heart trouble, which he said was partially true because he had a heart and it was troubled. And it is the troubled heart that always sets us off on our journey to Emmaus. Some of you have heard me speak before about John Claypool, um, who was an Episcopal priest in Birmingham, Alabama, uh, before his eventual retirement. And who, you remember, lost his daughter, Laura Lou, very early in her, her life in a battle with leukemia. That time was filled with sadness for, for Claypool and for his whole family. John had a good friend who at the time was actually the executive director of the Peace Corps and who came to visit the family soon after that and who sensed uh, the great sadness, the deadness uh, that had infected their whole family. And so at one point he said to John, you know, why don't you consider taking a sabbatical for a while, just getting away from all of this? He said, we need a new director of the Peace Corps in India. You would be a natural for the job. I'll, I'll, it'll give you a chance to uh, simply change your perspective. And John said, um, he began to think, you know, India is about as far away as I can get from all of this agony that I am feeling. And so he actually began to psych himself up uh, for that idea. He went through the entire interview process. But it turned out he didn't get the position. And later on, he went on to say that he was glad about that. He felt like the hand of God was in that decision. Because there is no escape 
from the, from the pain. The psalmist says we walk through the valley of the shadow, never around it. So I'm not surprised, really, that archaeologists can't locate Emmaus. It doesn't exist on the map of reality because it is always an illusion that somehow we can get away from the unbearable and that then life will become livable again. When we have no hope, all of those desperate attempts to escape, though completely understandable, are finally and ultimately futile. But if you listen to our scripture carefully this morning, you know that right in the middle of the story, it takes a surprising turn. Here were these men fleeing from what they could no longer stand, running to anywhere to get away from it. And on the road, they were intercepted by this stranger, one who, for one reason or another, they did not recognize at first. And he did what is perhaps the best thing that anyone can do for a person in grief. He had compassion on them. He gave them permission to tell their story. You know, when we're grieving, the truth is we don't need a little more advice. We certainly don't need to hear a sermon. What we need is somebody who is willing to listen to us and to let us know that what has happened is still significant. We tend to think that our job is to help a person um, get their mind off it, to think about anything else, when the truth is the worst fear that a grieving person has is that the world is going to go back to normal and this much-loved person is going to be forgotten forever. And so one of the best gifts that you can give to a person is the permission to unpack their hurts and pour out their pain, to allow them to continue to talk about that person who is still so significant to them. And that is precisely what Jesus did. And then he did something else that was very beautiful. In a sense, he picked them up and very gently moved them to another place. He gave them a different, a a wider perspective on the story that they had been telling. He let them see things from a different angle. And lo and behold, they began to see things that they had not seen in their rush to get to Emmaus. What he helped them to see is that what looks hopeless to us from the divine perspective is not hopeless at all. That God is greater than what we can imagine. And events that seem to us to make no sense, God has the power to somehow weave into the fabric of his story. He helped them to see that God's goodness is always bigger than our badness and even our sadness. And so, as they told their story, he gently but wisely reinterpreted it for them. And they began to see things from God's viewpoint rather than that of their own hopelessness. So when they got to the place where they were going, um, they invited him to stay with them. And it was as he broke bread with them that they recognized for the first time the very same one who had awakened hope in them years before. This one who had come to a group of Galilean peasants, nobodies by the world's standards, and gave them a sense of what they were really capable of, gave them a new sense of the future. He came alongside them and widened their perspective, helped them to see that there was more to their experience than just what they had lost. Many years ago, an Oriental man was converted to the Christian faith very dramatically. 
He had lived his entire life in a culture uh, that was dictated by um, the thought of Eastern religions. But suddenly the light of Christ began to shine in his heart and he began to see things in a different way. He was trying to tell one of his kinsperson what he had discovered in this Jesus. And what he said was this. He said, the God that Jesus shows me, the God of Easter, he can even make the sun to rise in the West. In other words, he can take things that look like they are coming to an end and show that they really are a new beginning. After all, this is the same God who at the beginning of time took absolutely nothing and made everything that is out of it. This is the God who on Easter morning took a dead corpse and called it back to life. And it was this God, the God who can make the sun rise in the west. This is the one who appeared to those grieving men on the road that day. And it's incredible. In just a, few, just a few hours before, they had been running to get away from life. Now, infused with this new sense of hope and the future, these same men intentionally turn back to Jerusalem. They could face what before had been so difficult and that they needed to run away from. You see, grief has a way of contracting our field of vision. So all that we can see is our pain. And yet the truth is there is much beside. And part of that much beside is the possibility that there can still be a future. Again, John Claypool shares this memory of Emmaus. He said that several weeks after his daughter Laura Lou died, uh, the rest of his family, which included his wife and their 12-year-old son, uh, they went out to a fish restaurant one night for dinner, a place that um, the four of them had gone many times before when Laura Lou was healthy. They sat down at the very same table that they had all sat at before. And John said the first thing he saw was that empty chair, which represented all that had been and never would be again. He thought to himself, I simply cannot stand it. Stop the world. I want to get off too. But then, just as Jesus had somehow shifted the perspective of those disciples, somehow John's vision was also shifted. He began to look at his 12-year-old son, who he said that light night looked so fragile and so sad. And then it dawned on him. If you give in to what you're feeling at this moment, if you quit life altogether, he's going to conclude that his life is of no value, that his sister is all that mattered to you. And then just as suddenly John realized that that wasn't true, it dawned on him, for all that I have lost, there is still much left, if only I am willing to look at it. There are still people to love, including my beloved son. There is still truth to be learned. There is still beauty to see. There is still creative work that is to be done. Suddenly the sun began to rise in the west. John said it was like coming out of the tomb into the sunlight. There is always more than our experience of grief. Although our pain has a way of making us so preoccupied with it that that's all that we can see and all that we can think about. There is always more in the giving of God than what or who we have lost. Therefore, this morning, every one of you who is acquainted with grief, like Beekner, like Claypool, you know where Emmaus is, though you will likely never find it on a map. 
What you will find, though, thanks be to God, is a love that will never let you go. What you will discover is a mercy which, though you may not recognize it at first, has been pursuing you every day of your life, even when you were running away from him. Who is he? He's the one who can make the sun rise in the west. What appears to be the end may be a new beginning. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us pray. We give you thanks this morning, Lord, for love that will not let us go. When life lets us down, and it does, we praise you for arms of compassion that catch us even as we fall, for mercy that not only waits patiently, but intentionally pursues us even as we try to run in the opposite direction. We say, where there is life, there is hope. But this morning we testify to the even greater truth, where there is hope, there is life. And you are our hope, O God of Easter. You who raised your only son from a hopeless, empty tomb, only the first fruits of those who have died. And we claim that promise of hope this morning, Lord, for our lives, for this church, for your world. For the temptation to give up and to become cynical, to wallow in despair, it is very real. Life sometimes crashes in us, in on us. The weight is so great. Each day the news has enough badness and sadness in it we can wonder, what's the point anyway? But into all of that heaviness, all of that despair, comes this Easter madness of yours, sparking our hopes again with hope, teasing us with promises of the future yet unseen. We taste it, however briefly, like a morsel of bread, and then just as suddenly, it's gone. And yet it's not. For there remains this willingness, this willingness to commit ourselves, our time, our treasure, to causes beyond ourselves, and to keep on loving, even for love's sake alone. Thanks be to you, O oh God, for this Easter madness, this madness that is greater than all of our grief and all of our pain, and for the hope of a tomorrow brighter than all of our yesterdays and todays. Now, loving God, gather all of our prayers together into the one prayer you taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let's stand.
Go now in the sure and certain hope of the resurrection. What appears to be the end may in fact be a new beginning. And as you go, may the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you always. Amen.